I'm Rhiannon McRae, the editor for Trends in Genetics, and I'm here with Julius Bernecki, who's at INBA in Vienna, and we're here to discuss his work, which actually started at Cold Spring Harbor. So could you just maybe introduce us to some of the work that you did when you were a postdoc here at Cold Spring Harbor? Yes, I started my postdoc in the laboratory of Greg Hannon, mm-hmm. actually right. basically <laughs> over there in a building called McClintock, mm-hmm. which interestingly enough, uh, fits very well to the topic so because it's Barbara, to Barbara McClintock, uh, yes, okay. uh, she discovered transposons in maize actually mm-hmm. when working here in Cold Spring Harbor. Mm-hmm. And at the time I joined the lab, um, small RNA pathways or generally RNA interference pathways were sort of really on the rise and uh, Greg Hannon was a, one of the big figures in this field. And he started to investigate heavily a germ cell specific class of small RNAs called PV interacting RNAs or short pi RNAs. Okay. And those turn really out to be the master control guardi- guardians uh, to repress transposable elements or selfish genes in, in animals. Okay, so can you back us up just for a minute and explain this idea of transposons as selfish genetic elements and where did they come from and what are they doing? Yes, I mean, <laughs> I, I give you my point of view, which is probably a little... Uh, blunt, but <coughs> <laughs> it turns out that essentially every eukaryotic genome contains uh, a variable amount of selfish genes or transposable mm-hmm. elements. These mm-hmm. are stretches of DNA which contain the information to jump around mm-hmm. by exploiting the host gene expression machinery. So these are basically they carry genetic information mm-hmm. which will uh, allow them to produce proteins which take the to the transposon and copy it into another okay. location. And by this they, of course, cause harm. And I think it is probably one of the oldest, if not the oldest, genetic conflict uh, on, on Earth. And so it has been, uh, ever since these transposons have entered genomes, it has been uh, a problem for host mm-hmm. organisms to repress their activity. Okay. So one of the ways that they repress the activity of transposable elements is mm-hmm. by using these small RNAs. Right. Okay. And this topic, in fact, is actually not animal-specific. Plants, mm-hmm. fungi, animals all use a small RNA pathway to suppress transposable elements. But the diversity is, is I mean, they're very different okay. types and so flavors. Coming back to the pi RNAs that you work on, so how widespread are pi RNAs? You mean amongst... Are they in all animals, in all right. eukaryotes? So I think one of, the, one of the fascinating things about small RNA pathways is that whenever you look at an into a, a different organism, a different animal species, you find slightly different nuances, and okay. sometimes you find very different mm-hmm. uh, features and patterns. Uh, and so, since biology is focusing so much onto model organisms, uh, we are maybe only at the beginning of understanding mm-hmm. how that is, and how uh, well to understand are they all similar or, or how yeah. diverse are they? And, and in fact. We already know from the few animal systems we studied, there is a huge diversity. C. elegans has pi RNAs, but mm-hmm. they function in a completely different manner. Okay. And so I think so more or less every animal will have them. Mm-hmm. So does C. elegans use some other small RNA to repress transposons? Uh, so they use, the field calls them as well pi RNAs, oh, because okay. by okay. definition but they are PV interacting, and mm-hmm. the proteins that bind to them mm-hmm. in C. elegans belong to the PV clade of proteins. Okay. But I think we, at the moment, have not a single protein which is shared between the two pathways. So does that suggest convergent evolution on a small RNA pathway? That So all eukaryotes have transposable elements, everyone has then to develop some kind of guardian against these, but it seems like different organisms have taken different routes to get there? I think what it, I mean, in my opinion, what it what it basically reflects is that the original principle that you have a small RNA which acts as a sequence specific mm-hmm. guide to recruit mm-hmm. the, the, the argonaut protein that is yeah. binding to the small RNA to a target RNA and then this target RNA can be silenced. This common principle is, is, is found in every small RNA pathway mm-hmm. and of course also in every pi RNA pathway. Mm-hmm. But for whatever reason in the germline evolution is able to juggle with this 
general principle and to hook onto this pathway different systems, different proteins, different uh, ways to how to make the small RNA mm -hmm. or whether the protein is acting in the nucleus or in the cytoplasm. And so I th it's one of the most fast evolving systems that I know mm -hmm. of, and maybe that's actually because of this fight between transposons and genome that this is one of the consequences. So in terms of germline, can you talk just a little bit more about, you know, is are transposable elements in the germline particularly difficult problem to overcome? or? This is maybe you know like the highest risk. So eukaryotic right, organisms right. have the most riding on being able to repress TEs in the germline. Right. Yeah, it's an interesting question because, in fact, when you look at where is the pyRNA pathway active, mm -hmm. then by and large it's the gonad, okay. and that is pretty much it. So okay. uh, then you immediately ask yourself, why would transposon control not be important in somatic cells? Mm -hmm. And I, we don't have satisfying answers, in my opinion. So uh, in 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 mammals. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that transposable elements are actually silenced at uh, DNA methylation level. And so yeah. they are basically shut down throughout the body to yeah. a large extent. Whereas in the germline where you have this rounds of demethylation and, mm -hmm. and so on, yeah. there it's, it's a vulnerable situation. Okay. Second uh, clear aspect is the germline genome is essentially the most important one. Mm -hmm. uh, and so host organisms have a huge interest in protecting that mm -hmm. genome in, in a very particular manner. And the third aspect is for the transposon in the evolutionary term, jumping around in somatic cells is of limited use. In fact, it might even harm the host and thereby limit okay. evolutionary okay. success of the transposon. Mm -hmm. So for them, it's very clear that their, their promoters have, to, have evolved to be particularly active in germ cells. So it's basically the battleground for, okay. for the entire biology here. Okay. Um, so I haven't heard your talk yet, um, but I know that you had a recent paper out. So do you want to maybe tell us a little bit more about some of the work that you've done more recently in your own lab in Vienna? Yes. So <coughs> or maybe one of the fascinating things, in my opinion, about this pathway, in contrast to the much better understood uh, microRNA pathway mm -hmm. or short interfering RNA pathway, where let's say about eight, nine, maximum 10 proteins are specifically involved in those pathways. The pyRNA pathway probably has to deal with about 40 to 50 proteins. So there is a, is a definitely a different layer of complexity mm -hmm. for this pathway. But my lab has chosen to, to not really work on each individual protein and try to understand how these proteins are now building up the pathway. But we are really trying to focus on, on three major uh, themes in this pathway. And the first theme is how does the cell actually manage to distinguish a transposon RNA mm -hmm. from any other cellular right. RNA. Yeah, self from. Be exactly, the, yeah. the, the classical cell from non-self from non yeah. question. And in terms of silencing, you could say that's actually very easy because if I, as a cell, if I manage to put a small RNA into a PV family protein and that RNA is complementary to transposons, my specificity problem mm -hmm. is solved. But that just shifts the problem one level up. <laughs> How do you make yeah. the small yeah, RNA? Yeah. And mm -hmm. that's really one of the most fascinating questions in me. Uh, for me, <coughs> how is the cell distinguishing the precursors, mm -hmm. which will end up yeah. in pyRNAs versus all of the other mm -hmm. uh, mRNAs? So that's one specific question. And our recent work, I think, shed some interesting light on, on a, one major possibility that is being exploited by the pathway. And that is a coupling between the silencing step and the pyRNA biogenesis step. Okay. So in other words, if, if the cell has a, a transposon transcript, and a pyRNA is guiding a PV clay protein to this transcript, mm -hmm. which will lead to cleavage. Mm -hmm. The entire three prime end of that transcript will make new pyRNAs. Okay. Those pyRNAs will be loaded okay. into a nuclear PV family protein, which will go to the nucleus and mm -hmm. there exert its oh. silencing function. Okay. So this is sort of a. Mm -hmm. I think th so. That's only one of the, the themes. The other theme is how are the loci in the genome which encode the uh, pyrene precursors, how are those transcribed? Because it happens to be that these are in, within heterochromatin, oh. which typically is transcriptionally inert. Mm -hmm. and so is that the case though in the germline? So if you're going through some of this, you know, like massive demethylation or reprogramming, mm -hmm. is that hetero is are those still in a heterochromatic region or at that point would that region be more accessible and so mm -hmm. that region would be transcribed and again it would make sense that that's the point in time when you would most need the pi RNAs. So the so DNA methylation as a, as a major epigenetic or as a major strong silencing mark is actually not 
present in, in Drosophila, which is the model system that okay. my lab is working on. Okay. But nevertheless, the question is still valid. Uh, are those areas which are heterochromatin, mm -hmm. uh, is there a... Is there something something special about germ cells mm -hmm. that they, they would allow transcription yeah. of these loci? And it turns out that in Trosophila there's a, an ingenious solution to the problem. Because so as far as we understand heterochromatin, uh, it, it, it is defined via, via chromatin modifications. Mm -hmm. And so one of the strongest and most powerful chromatin modifications for, for transposon heterochromatin is uh, histone H3 uh, lysine 9 methylation. Mm -hmm. And all this, t in all cells, this typically brings down uh, a protein called HP1, mm -hmm. which recognizes this chromatin mark and is somehow recruiting other factors yep. to shut down this entire yep. area for, for transcription uh, mm -hmm. or for the axis of transcription factors and so on. And it turns out that in flies, there is an HP1 family protein called Rhino, mm -hmm. which was discovered by Bill Therkov, uh, which it's, it's, it's magic. It, it goes to the same loci, heterochromatin, mm -hmm. and it piggybacks a bunch of other proteins, which literally trick RNA polymerase 2 into sitting down in these areas and yeah, starting yeah. to randomly transcribe. But this is the interpretation we have at the okay. moment. So and this is happening in germline cells? Exactly. Or? Okay. And those okay. proteins are germline specific. Okay. okay. And right in fact, I think what is fascinating about it, so once, once we understood a little bit about this, we thought, well, this is such a crazy process. It has mm -hmm. to be deeply conserved. The five proteins that are involved in this pathway are, or in this process mm -hmm. are Drosophila specific. So we don't even find them in, in, in the honeybee. Uh, we only find them in Drosophila genomes. Remind me, do, do honeybees have DNA methylation? I mean, do you think it's connected to this idea that maybe, you know, Drosophila doesn't use DNA methylation right. and so it may right. have a somewhat more unusual pathway for doing this, whereas other organisms that are using right. DNA methylation as a silencing mechanism that may use sort of a, different, be, yes. a different system yes. for... That might be an interesting concept, but I think so the connection that we currently see is that Drosophila has three PV family proteins mm -hmm. which do the silencing job, and one of them is in the nucleus. And this nuclear PV family protein is, is sort of a speciality of Drosophila. So okay. when you go to uh, another system that is being worked on, uh, the silkworm, uh -huh. uh, Bombix mori, for example, they only have cytoplasmic PV family proteins. And it turns out that the nuclear PV family protein is actually important for this rhino biology mm -hmm. that I was mentioning, the heterochromatin biology, because PV is instructing, to some extent, where rhino is, should sit down. Mm -hmm. okay. So without a nuclear PV family protein, yeah. I think this entire nuclear biology will be much, much less mm -hmm. complex in these in, in, in these systems. And so it's, it turns out, it seems as if, and again, we are coming back to this mm -hmm. idea that evolution is playing yeah. with this system. It, it seems as if the nuclear PV family protein, in insects at least, is something that is relatively uh, unique as far as we can tell in, in Drosophila. And, but what's interesting, mammals also have a nuclear PV family protein. Okay. And this might be in but they fact don't have convergent any rhino evolution. homolog. Or right, exactly. Like this. They don't okay. have a rhino homolog. So okay. this might be a uh, convergent okay. uh, situation. Are, are the peewee proteins themselves relatively well conserved? Yes. So they go basically in every animal. Okay. You will find a peewee plate okay. protein. Yes. But whether or not there's a nuclear or cytoplasmic, there seems to be some variation. Right. It, it, it's. I think the, the, the data at the moment would support that the cytoplasmic. Uh, mechanism is the more ancient one. Okay. So Dave Bertel has shown mm -hmm. that ping pong, which is yeah. a cytoplasmic amplification mm -hmm. system for mm -hmm. pyranase, is conserved down to sponges. Okay. And uh, I think it seems as if that is the ancient system. Okay. So you said when you started that at the time that you came to Cold Spring Harbor to start your postdoc that pyranase were still kind of a mm. nascent field, if you will. Right. So where do you see this field going maybe in 10 or 20 years? I mean, is there still... Ten. Still working on <laughs> 10, 20 years is a long time. <laughs> okay, uh, how, about, how about five? <gasps> so I think when I, when I started my postdoc in Greg's lab, it was really an untouched territory and there was uh, wonderful genetics being done on, on transposon silencing and also uh, elements of this pathway have been found genetically by, by people that worked on transposons or uh, mm -hmm. people like Ruth Lehmann yeah. or Trudy Schübach working on, on germline development uh, because it's all interconnected and, and so these genes were found in genetic screens and when RNAi entered the scene 
I think now this all of these fields are sort of colliding, mm -hmm. uh, which is a very yeah. interesting yeah. Uh, situation. Now I think we have started to really relatively robustly define the features of this pathway, mm -hmm. and, and and many of the general concepts I think have now been uh, at least laid out. Mm -hmm. And uh, the challenge now is to bridge this to chromatin biology. Mm -hmm. Because at some point this pathway has to talk right. to the basic chromatin right. machinery and mm -hmm. transcription machinery. Uh, a second huge challenge will be to understand at the mechanistic level how these proteins mm -hmm. are working. Mm -hmm. And here it's a <laughs> typic, difficult uh, topic. For example, pyrene biogenesis happens to occur to a large extent on, on the outer mitochondrial membrane. And so this just gives you an idea uh, about the complexity yeah. of also in cell biological yeah, terms. Yeah. So there will be proteins that recruit the RNA to the mitochondrial right. surface and there will be a nuclease that sits there. Mm -hmm. You have RNA helicases feeding in mm -hmm. the RNA and it's a staggering complexity. Yeah. And I, I think this, the, the skill will be to combine genomics with computational biology plus biochemistry uh, and classical chromatin biology. So are you interested in branching out from Drosophila to see if you can find RNA or sort of similar pathways in other organisms, perhaps non-model organisms. And right. as you mentioned at the beginning <coughs> that we're somewhat limited by yes, um, yes. the organisms that we study. So, what else is out there? It's it's a tempting. <laughs> it's it's very tempting, uh, especially because of the abilities we have right. now with right. sequencing, uh, short mm -hmm. read, long read, mm -hmm. genome assemblies. I mean, it's and also it, genome it's editing, which exactly. hopefully will work in exactly. a wide range of species and. That's Open right. New, uh, my new lab organisms. has so far focused exclusively on Drosophila. Uh, my, I'm, I'm a passionate Drosophila geneticist and I just find that system so powerful. Uh, you don't want to move playground. into ants like Shelley Berger? <laughs> As I said, it's very tempting, but I think it requires the right people to... Yeah. I mean, I, I don't impose myself on what people in the lab should do, but if somebody comes and has a oh. very strong interest to set up such a domain, I yeah. think it's the right time to do it. Right? It'll be very interesting to see what else Absolutely. is out there. Yes. Okay, um, I have one last question since we are here celebrating 150 years of Gregor Mendel's laws. So do you remember when you learned about Gregor Mendel's laws of inheritance or when you saw Punnett Square for the first time? I <laughs> think, actually, I mean, probably I learned at school, but I, <laughs> my first uh, remembering of, of the Mendel laws was at university. Mm -hmm when a friend of mine gave, uh, so we had to prepare uh, seminars at university and I was uh, attending a seminar and a fr friend of mine had to introduce Mendel laws. Mm -hmm. But rather than taking the P's and, uh, and that system, he used uh, two other trends which apparently are inherited in a, in a Mendelian mm -hmm. fashion and one is tongue rolling which is a Mendelian trait. I've heard that that's apocryphal, but go on. Uh, that's what he, I, I'm what not, he, I'm not, he, I'm not going to say, but, <laughs> okay. And the other one is, is even more exotic, is okay. apparently, when, so when you eat asparagus, yes, your, I've heard your, that your that's pee true. smells. I've and, heard that that's and true. And there are apparently people where it doesn't, and so there's a Mendelian trait apparently as well. I think it's whether or not you smell it. Uh, I think uh, that's the So it's anyway, whether I smell it. Okay. Really, that's a very cool example, and a, and so a, that's, a memorable that's way to be So that's stuck in my head. All right. Thank you. Thank you.